A priest, a minister, and a rabbit walk in to deliver blood. The priest says, I'm a type A. The minister says, I'm a type B. The rabbit says, I think I'm a typo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Paul, that's, that's, yeah. that's solid. It's okay. a typo, and then also it's, it's not rabbit. Yeah, I, think, I like yeah. it. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Frank Watto, here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Paul, how are you doing today? I'm just told upon Matt, I don't feel good. I feel kind of sick, actually. Yeah, this is weird. This is, <laughs> are we, is this a Twilight Zone? I, I, this might be a Jacob's Ladder scenario. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on today's episode, we are going to discuss antiplatelets, uh, antiplatelets, anticoagulation, really secondary and primary prevention of cardiovascular disease or primary and a half prevention, as we'll get to. Our guest was Dr. Don Lloyd-Jones, uh, who I'll tell you more about in a minute. But Paul, Paul, first, would you tell people what is it that we do on the show and maybe throw in where where are we as we're doing this? Oh, sure. That's a good idea, Matt. So we are, we are the internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. Um, this time we got our expert uh, at ACP. We are at ACP's uh, national conference, uh, annual conference, annual national conference, in any case. Internal medicine meeting 2023. I, hashtag. We are in San Diego, uh, which is how we managed to corral Dr. Lloyd-Jones in to talk to us. Though I'm sure he'd have been happy to in any circumstance, but we're, we're grateful to have the chance at this meeting to do so. Um, so before I ramble on too much further, Matt, why don't I let you tell us about our guests and a little bit about what we talked about. Sure. So our guest is Dr. Don Lloyd-Jones. He attended Swarthmore College for his BA majoring in history, Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons for his MD, Harvard School of Public Health for a Master's of Science in Epidemiology. He was a resident, chief resident and cardiology fellow at Massachusetts General Hospital and junior faculty at Harvard Medical School. In 2004, he moved to Northwestern and in 2009, he became the chair of the Department of Preventive Medicine from 20 2012 to 2020, he was a senior associate dean for clinical and translational research and the director of the New Cats Institute. In 2021 to 2022, he served as the president of the American Heart Association and absolutely just a great guy. Really enjoyed speaking with him. So, uh, without further ado, actually, with one one further ado, Paul, <laughs> just uh, the one. A reminder that this episode and most episodes are available for CME for all health professionals through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And please check the show notes for any disclosures because I don't have them in front of me right now. <laughs> well, Don, uh, we've been chatting for a while. We're going to bring the audience in with us on this. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, first question we want to hear from you is... Tell us a hobby or interest that you have outside of medicine. Um, thank you so much. It's great to be here with you. Um, important topic today, talking about antiplatelet and antithrombotic therapies. Yes. But um, for me, even more important is I am a huge national park enthusiast. And the more I can hike or just be in national parks, the happier I am. Oh, fantastic. So tell me your because this has been something on my list of things to do. Like I just saw the Grand Canyon for the first time in the past three years. Shame on you. I, I, listen, I know. Um, <laughs> But now that I have like doctor money, I'm able to do so. So I guess now, now, now that I'm you know flush with money and rich, where where should I visit in the country? What are what you're, were your favorite? You're not just a poor country doc. Yes, yes, right. <laughs> okay, still simple, but now you know very very wealthy, obviously from the podcast. <laughs> um, we yeah, what, what recommendations? Yeah, your um, top one. I'll well, take the top three even. You know Yosemite, of course, right? You just can't get away from it. My um, my family has a long history there. My dad actually worked in Yosemite uh, for two summers during college and. He was the guy who made the firefall. I don't know if you know about the firefall, but no. it was a legendary thing back in the 50s and 60s in Yosemite. And they would push embers over the cliff and they would reignite as they fell. And it was this beautiful thing. Um, but of course, not- I am Googling that later. <laughs> not necessarily safe, yeah. uh, right? <laughs> so. Um, and so they don't do that anymore. Um, but huh. uh, so anyway, he made sure we went there about every three to five years. And I've just continued that tradition with our family and wow. he can't get enough of it. That's- Excellent. That's an excellent so recommendation. So many good hikes there and so many good things to see. Uh, how many run-ins have you had with bears in your national park enthusiasm? That's one of the things that I worry about. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, certainly have run into bears. Um, I'm six, eight, 
And yeah. so, so you, when you, when you I put can the make arms myself up. big and the bears have not bothered me. Okay, uh, that's good. So, um, and you know, it's interesting. We were in Alaska in some national parks last, last uh, summer and they spent a lot of time warning you about the bears. But the truth is um, when, when it comes down to it, they say, if it's a bear, get big, make noise and they'll go away. It's the moose you have to be afraid of. Oh yeah. I heard bear, about that. Hold your ground and get big moose run like hell, apparently. <laughs> Um, and because the moose is actually more dangerous. Who knew? Wow. Yeah. I feel like I saw a video of someone who covered themselves in moose urine to go hunting or something and then just got stampeded repeatedly. Like it, was, <laughs> it was kind of hard to watch, but also kind of great at the same time. Um, I think that bear spray is just pepper spray. And I think that would probably work on a moose too, right? It's uh, just blind, blinding so. them. Yeah. yeah. I assume so. Medical advice. We're <laughs> Medical advice. Yeah. Narrow therapeutic window apparently on moose urine. <laughs> yes. Yeah. As well. Yes. I intend to not find out. <laughs> All right. Paul, before we get to a case, anything you want to, wanted to ask? Oh, um, I, 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 let's ask the, any meaningful advice or feedback that you received either during your career or training or that you like to give. Yeah. You know, maybe the best advice I ever got, um, you know, cause busy clinician, I do some research, you know, I do some teaching, things like that. Um, <clears throat> somebody took me aside and said, uh, if you really want to do something and they've asked you to do it, but it's just not the wrong time, say no. And which is to say, say no now. And you know what? Things will be better in a year. Please, please recontact me because I would love to consider this again. And it's never failed. If it was something I really wanted to do, they, they called back. Um, and, you know, oftentimes that year later was better and sometimes it wasn't. And I said it again, um, but it really works. So that's a good way to say no, but still get to do things that you really enjoy doing. Yeah, well, thank you so much for saying yes to this because I'm excited. <laughs> oh, what a segue. To, well, I was tempted. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm very, very excited to uh, to talk to you about this topic, which it kind of, it's a vexing topic, Paul. You agree? Like in, in primary care, we, we see a lot of people coming in out of the hospital, in and out of cardiac events and, you know, knowing what to continue, what not to continue. So hopefully we can shed some light on that today. This is one of the topics in, in, in the resident clinic where like resident asks me, well, how long should we do this for? And I'll be like, this is one of those things you should look up and get back to me. I mean, I know, but I just want to find out if you know. And then <laughs> I frankly look it up in the background. Yeah, it's a scary topic. So I'm glad to have your expertise. Yeah. And you, you told us, uh, I hope it's okay to say, you said your wife is a primary care doctor. So she keeps you honest about this stuff around the house. So I, I feel like we have a, you'll probably be exceptionally good at explaining this to us, right? Cause you're, um, you're used to these conversations. I am very used to these conversations. She, she asks me so many good questions and I do the same thing. I have to, <laughs> well, um, you know what, sweetie, I got to go do this thing, but I'll be right back. <laughs> um, and, uh, no, she, she's, she's an amazing doc and, um, definitely keeps me honest. And as we like to say, she is <clears throat> underwhelmed and unimpressed by my credentials. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so definitely keeps me on the straight and narrow. All right. Well, Paul, let's let's give him a case from Cashlack to start us off. Jack is an 84-year-old gentleman with a history of CAD, type 2 diabetes, atrial fibrillation, currently on a Pixaban, hypertension, CKD3, DJD of the knees and hips, um, uses a walker, who has been admitted for an end semi. He had a drug loading stent placed in the mid-LAD. His LV function is preserved. Certainly, he needs some sort of antiplatelet therapy, maybe even dual antiplatelet therapy, but he's already on the apixaban, and already we're kind of stymied and terrified that we're going to cause some sort of terrifying bleed, but we also don't want him to have instant thrombosis. So we need your help to tell us what to do with, with all of his medications. So I think even before we get into how you might approach this patient, if you could just even define for us, we're going to use the terms double and triple therapy a lot here, and since there's lots of medications at play, I would love to hear exactly what your definitions are, just so that we're all kind of on the same page to start. Sure, yeah. So so we, we do talk about triple therapy, double therapy, and monotherapy, and that's really the step down we're going to talk about for this particular patient, mm -hmm. um, because as you said, he has atrial fibrillation, he's on a direct oral anticoagulant um, medication, now he's come in and required a stent for an acute coronary syndrome event. Um, he requires dual antiplatelet therapy for at least a little while to make sure that we get that stent off to a good start, that mm -hmm. it, we don't court the risk of stent thrombosis. And acute stent thrombosis in the near term after stent deployment will not be adequately treated by the direct oral anticoagulant alone. Yeah. So um, you want to keep going on that or what What else would you like to talk about? So, so, so I'm yeah, sorry, so, so dual triple therapy. therapy. Yeah, yeah, so dual, dual antiplatelet therapy or DAPT as a lot of people yeah. abbreviated notes, that's like two antiplatelets, so aspirin, clopidogrel. Correct. But this dual therapy versus triple therapy sure. that Paul's talking about, yeah. what's, so what's triple therapy? That's... Yeah, yeah. thank you for, for getting me back on track. <laughs> Just like my wife. Um, <laughs> so, so triple therapy is an oral anticoagulant. Um, so that's an antithrombotic. Mm -hmm. 
um, and dual antiplatelet therapy, aspirin plus a P2Y12 inhibitor like clopidogrel, mm -hmm. like agrilor or prasugrel. So that's triple therapy. The step down comes to double therapy, mm -hmm. and this may actually throw people a little bit. That is the oral anticoagulant for the AFib and the P2Y12 inhibitor. So we drop aspirin first right. in these cases. A little bit unexpected maybe for some people because of some more recent data. Monotherapy in the long run for this patient is just going to be the oral anticoagulant. So the apixaban or the rivaroxaban right. um, without aspirin or dual antiplatelet, the, the P2Y12 inhibitor, because mm. once we're certainly 12 months beyond his acute event, um, the oral anticoagulant alone is enough to protect that stent. So this patient will never be without something. Yes. Um, but because of the AFib, the oral anticoagulant can, can serve as monotherapy for all of their wow. conditions. And so the idea the is run. as you get further, f far enough out from this, he, this is a coronary event we presented. The, the patient uh, had an end STEMI. So we're, we're going to have him on a P2Y12 and an oral anticoagulant for some duration of time, maybe a year or so. And then at some point we might say, okay, now this thing's re-epithelialized. Is that what you're, you're Basically thinking? Basically right, or re-endothelialized, Endothe exactly. Endothelialized, yeah, yeah. So, sorry. So, so let me play it out for you. So, so for this patient, um, the sort of default approach would be in the hospital, triple therapy. He gets mm -hmm. his oral anticoagulant for that chronic atrial fibrillation. We put the stent in and immediately he's on aspirin and the P2Y12 inhibitor. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the default will be we're going to keep him on all three of those for a month. Okay. Then stop the aspirin, mm -hmm. keep him on the oral anticoagulant and the P2Y12 inhibitor because it's an acute Cori syndrome, probably out to six months, but as much as 12. Yeah. And then after 12 months, just the oral anticoagulant. Okay. So that's the default. Now, within that, we like to think about, well, okay, some of our patients are at higher ischemic risk mm -hmm. that they could have a recurrent ischemic event. So if that's the case, we're actually going to keep that dual antiplatelet therapy um, for, for the month. And then, um, you know, could go out as long as three months for that yeah. patient, just to make sure that, you know, a stent placed in an active lesion, we've got that really well re-endothelialized. Right. And then the dual therapy out to 12 months and then monotherapy after 12. Yeah. And but so this has to be a patient that you're, that the, you're worried that you're not, the bleeding risk is acceptable and they have a really high risk of ischemia. Correct. Yes. Okay. But if I'm, if this was kind of a stable, uh, you know, stable lesion, um, I'm not so worried. They don't have a lot of other plaque, but I'm more worried about the bleeding risk. And we can talk about how to quantify that yeah. bleeding risk. Um, but if I'm more worried about the bleeding risk, I'm going to get them off the aspirin within a week. Mm -hmm. um, so dual therapy, then only to three months and then switch over to the, the monotherapy as soon as we can. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. Yeah. I would like to hear about this calculus because I'm looking at Jack um, as a yeah. reminder who looks like an extraordinarily high risk of ischemic stuff. Like he's you a bet. patient with diabetes, he has known CAD, and then this new recent event, the atrial fibrillation, but also designed by the cruel Matt Watto as someone who is likely to have some sort of, not likely, but could potentially <laughs> yeah. have a bad outcome. He's yeah. old, has potential for falls, he has CKD3, so all these things increase the risk for like GI bleeding or intracranial bleeding. So how, how are you sizing this patient up in terms of, because it sounds like it's just a matter of sort of moving the various styles in terms of duration more than- That's right. Um, yeah. The, more than what you're using. So I'd love to know how you think about this and actually quantify these kind of risks. Yeah, we're committed to some triple therapy because he's got the fresh stent and mm -hmm. the atrial fibrillation. We're going to get the aspirin off more quickly if we think he's high bleeding risk and then just be on the dual therapy of the oral anticoagulant P2Y12 and get to, to monotherapy more quickly if we're worried about the bleed risk. How do we quantify that bleed risk? Yeah. You know, just as we have the CHADS2 VASC score for thinking about who we want to treat for uh, anticoagulation right. for stroke prophylaxis, we have the has bled score. Yep. Right? Another nine point score. <laughs> Pretty easy to remember. H is hypertension. A is abnormal kidney or liver function. Get one point for each of those. Okay. S is for history of stroke. So that's the has. Mm -hmm. B is history of bleeding. L is labile INRs if they've been on Coumadin previously. Mm -hmm. E is elderly, more than 65. Uh, and D is drug or alcohol use that would affect either because of a drug interaction or alcohol use that could affect their liver function. Okay. So has bled, nine point score. Yeah. <clears throat> if it's three or more, and I want to say this carefully, that is not a contraindication to anticoagulation. 
Uh -huh. What it means is we should fix what we can fix about their bleeding risk and then monitor them much more carefully. Okay. But it's not a contraindication to that oral anticoagulant for their AFib. Yeah. So and I think, you know, I get it. Like we always worry. Well, yes. this guy could really bleed, but he could also have that massive AFib related embolic stroke and live. Yeah. yeah. And, and he will not be, thank you. Yes. So the, so this patient <clears throat> has definitely age, high high blood pressure and CKD. So he's three. got a score of three, exactly. Three. And yep. we so we'll, we didn't give any substance use, so I think we're at we're at three for this. So yeah. So so um, you know, I think he's appropriately on the oral anticoagulant, mm -hmm. but we want to you know might want to think about a PPI. We might want to make sure that his environment is safe and he's not at risk for mechanical falls. Do everything we can to avoid those things, and then. Keep him on the oral anticoagulant. Um, okay. You know, as long as is is reasonable. You know, if he's continuing to be walkie-talkie, right? It it sounds like this is probably going to. You're probably going to be working with a cardiologist to to do this calculus. Um, I, I'm not sure if you think that's the best route, or if if primary care doctors should feel comfortable pulling the trigger. I mean, certainly if it's like a year out and, you know, the, yeah. the further out, but in that first 12 months, it sounds like that's the higher risk time where maybe you want some more input. I think that's right. I think it's really important to talk to the person who does the revascularization yeah. and say, okay, you know, um, this lesion, was this a really high risk lesion where we're going to want to, you know, treat that longer and make sure that stent really gets off to a good start or it's a pretty routine lesion and we don't have to worry about, you know, continuing um, all of this as right. long. Um, and, um, you know, and then bring your knowledge of the of the bleeding risk to this. Okay. You know, but but I would definitely talk to the person who did the revascularization. And say, do you feel like this is you know high ischemia risk in the next twelve months mm. or routine low? In which case, you know, you, you okay. might you might get them off earlier. Yeah. So yeah, so the ischemia risk would would depend on the anatomy. What what sort of what was that hardware was put in? If that's the right yeah, terminology. Yeah, the acuity and, of the presentation. If right. it was if it was a stable, you know, chronic angina, uh -huh. um, and the stent was put in for that, that's a different scenario. You don't need to treat as long as if it was an acute coronary okay. syndrome uh, driven revascularization. I I have questions about with the with the newer, more potent P two I twelves, the Ticagrelor, the Prasegrel. Uh, versus clopidogrel. Yeah. How do you think about those in your head? I don't see as much prasigrel. Paul and I were talking about that. I, I saw some scary, like older age and yeah. you know some scarier things with that. It seems like maybe that's not used as much. But how, how should we think of those? What any how how should we differentiate as primary care docs? Yeah, I think you know I think from from the primary care perspective, the reason why we like ticagrelor in particular, but sometimes prasigrel is faster onset of action. So that's what we like to use in the acute setting when okay. there's a fresh stent going in or in, um, and, and because we're just gonna get you know, more FXC more mm -hmm. quickly. Um, the studies over the intermediate term do show that uh, compared with clopidogrel, ticagrelor and prasugrel both are associated with marginally lower recurrent ischemic events. Mm -hmm. uh, prasugrel, a little bit more bleeding, ticagrelor a little bit less bleeding mm. than clopidogrel. So, so I think that's why you're not seeing as much prasugrel yeah. in part. Um, but the truth is, once you're really out from the acute event, three months or longer, if the patient has that funny side effect to ticagrelor, I don't know if you've seen this, but some patients have this funny dyspnea reaction. To yeah, I was, I was reading about that. And there's yeah. also bradyarrhythmias reported Can be. too. That's okay. right. There was just a Tony Brewer tutorial, by the way, on ticagrelor and dyspnea. Yeah. Um, interesting. It, and so think of it as a possibility. Yeah. Um, but um, but uh, if they're having that, or if there are cost issues, very reasonable to switch them over, even at a month, but certainly by three months to clopidogrel okay. for their chronic therapy. At that, that will be their P2Y12. And you can't just sort of switch day to day. You do have to do a 300 milligram load uh -huh. uh, 12 hours after their ticagrelor dose, and then just go once a day on the clopidogrel. With the oh, 70, wow. 75 I feel milligrams. like a lot of people would not think to do that. Yeah, but you, you, you do have to do a load. Um, that that might that's scary, Paul. I don't, <laughs> usually, I'm, uh, if I've if I've ever know, done clopidogrel yeah. loading, it's usually been in the hospital. Yeah, but most of the time, of course, you would get away with it, but you don't want to be the time that doesn't get right. away with it. Yeah, so. I feel like this early on. This is again something else where I'd be talking to cardiologists, like, "Hey, I'm thinking about doing this thing. Is there anything?" Because I'm also just a nervous person in general, and we're just like everyone's blessing for everything. So I think that's something I'm probably yeah talking about. Not wrong. The, the other thing about this that's been just kind of around, and I, we, can, we can throw this question out if, if, if it's a bad one, but clopidogrel, 
you know, there's genetic, like yeah. g- genetic variability that affects how, how active it is for a given patient. And then there's some drug interactions with the and things like that. What do you make of that? Do you think that, is that important for us to consider? You know, um, I think there was some enthusiasm for doing platelet function studies or genetic testing, you know, early on when these were identified. Um, at least in our practice, we don't routinely look for that. Um, okay. We will use, still use clopidogrel. Um, if a patient has a recurrent event, you know, a stent thrombosis that was unanticipated or unexpected, um, you know, then we'll make sure that whatever we put them on next, which won't be clopidogrel, yes. you know, is actually limiting their platelets or we'll do the genetic testing to understand what to do going forward. Okay. Um, but but we're not doing that routinely on the front end. Unless yeah. there's a recurrent event that is okay. unexpected. Yeah, because I, I, I've started to see some people test this. I guess it's some time, some way you're testing P2Y12 activity. Is that sort of the right. idea? It, exactly. Okay. Essentially, that's right. Yeah. So. so I guess stay tuned for that audience. I don't. I don't know how... It's not, it's not so super mainstream yet, or no. maybe we don't yeah, know exactly how to interpret the testing and that timing and all that. I imagine that has to be sorted out a bit. I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it's available, but I don't think um, we should be making routine clinical decisions on it or, yeah. or measuring it routinely. And I, I like that you mentioned the cost with the Cagalor, because I, I have had that come up for a couple patients. They, and it was a couple months, you know, the first refill they got through, usually the hospitals discharge them with 30 to 90 days. And so that maybe even the social worker helped get it covered. But then when it's time for that refill, it's been a problem. And knowing knowing you might be able to switch them over at that time is that's, that's good to know. Yeah. Quite reasonable. Yeah. All right, Paul, let's, let's move on uh, with the case here. Before we do, you had brought up PPI, which I think is a great question to ask. I mean, when, when would you consider that? Is that an automatic with triple therapy specifically, or when, when do you pull the trigger on prescribing a PPI if they're not already on one, which seems like a miracle at this point? (laughs) Uh, You know, certainly low threshold for anybody with bleeding history, mono dual Mm -hmm. or triple therapy, I think reasonable to consider this for sure. uh, If they've got a a GI bleeding history, Um, you know, I, I guess I would say if, if in the absence of a GI bleeding history, um, you know, the, the, the short-term risk is pretty low, especially if you're going to get them off the aspirin, right? Because sure, P2Y12s block platelet activity, oral mm-hmm. anticoagulants block the thrombotic cascade, but aspirin is the problem because it actually directly irritates the stomach lining also, mm-hmm. right? In addition to, to blocking platelet activity. So, so um, now that we're sort of de-escalating the aspirin first, I worry a little bit less about it, I have to say, at least in terms of GI oh, okay. bleeding, right? Okay. And so, um, you know, worth, worth thinking about for sure, especially if there's a bleeding history. But, um, you know, if, if we're going to get the aspirin off soon, I'm a little bit less worried about mm-hmm. it. Fair. So, Jack, our first, this first patient here, so this was just to remind the audience, uh, we're, we're going to close this case out. So he had AFib. He was already on a Pixaban. Then he had the end STEMI. So we briefly had him on triple therapy. Let's say it was the first month because we thought his bleeding risk was acceptable. And then we had him on a P2Y12, clopidogrel plus a Pixaban. And then... Uh, out, out to six or 12 months, depending on how things are going months. on. Yeah. But beyond 12 months, just the oral anticoagulant. Just the oral anticoagulant. Okay. So now let's switch it up a little bit. Paul, you want to throw a curveball here? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how much of a curveball it'll be, but yeah. So we're going to change the case a little bit and and have someone who develops the need for anticoagulation who already has CAD. So it will, it's still our friend Jack, but in this case, he has our chronic stable CAD. He's on aspirin for moderate uh, coronary atherosclerosis seen on uh, CT imaging that everyone has because they walk through the door. Um, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, CKD, DJD of the knees and hips. He uses a walker. He's admitted with new atrial fibrillation. We calculate his Chad's to, um, Chad's two vas score, uh, and it comes to four, and we decide to start a Pixaban to prevent uh, stroke. So, again, a little bit sort of less, maybe less urgency to it. Though I guess there's there's arguments made that we probably wait too long to start patients on um, Doax in any case, but that's a talk for a different day. But our first question for you is: Should we be continuing aspirin for our friend Jack that we've now started a Pixaban on for this new atrial fibrillation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, great question. So. You know, forgetting the atrial fibrillation for a moment, he has an indication for essentially lifelong aspirin therapy. Mm-hmm. Mm, you'll start to see maybe that turn into lifelong P2I12 therapy uh, as we gather more evidence, perhaps. Mm-hmm. But let's say he's going to be on an antiplatelet for that CAD for life, yeah, unless something else intervenes. Um, so now he's got atrial fibrillation. He's still got that has blood score of three, so we're a little bit worried about him but we're even more worried because of the CHAD-STUVAS score of four. 
um, he is above that net benefit threshold, he should be on an oral anticoagulant. Mm -hmm. Two or higher in men, three or higher in women on the Chad Stuvask, clear indication for um, an oral anticoagulant. So he fits that. Um, and uh, so I would get that started as soon as possible, uh, probably acutely in the hospital, he's on uh, yeah. heparin, um, but uh, get him switched over to the oral and he gets discharged. There's, there's no clear guidance on this, but what I would do is I would keep him on both for about a month. And if things are going well with the oral anticoagulant, I would stop his aspirin at that point. Um, because again, we don't need both. The oral anticoagulant yeah. will take care of his CAD in addition to his atrial fibrillation. Is, um, the, is the overlap just in case he doesn't fill the new med, like the new oral yes. anticoagulant, or he doesn't like it and decides to stop taking it, now he's yes. on nothing? Or, you know, he has some um, hematuria, Okay. let's say, and we're going to have to now figure that out. And, you know, it's going to be a negotiation with us and the urologist about, you know, well, are we going to keep him on aspirin? Are we going to keep him on this other thing? Probably going to stop the DOAC at that point, honestly, okay. and try to keep him on a little bit of aspirin while you figure out his hematuria. So, so I like to give him a little bit of time to see if we're going to have some acute bleeding oh, problem. Okay. And then if not, great, I'm going to stop the aspirin and just press on with the DOAC. Yeah. And this is, you know, you, you mentioned, you kind of teased it a little bit there that it, it sounds like is the, think, is the thinking now because these P2Y12 inhibitors are more potent than aspirin or they're more, I guess, slightly more effective at secondary prevention that that might going forward be what we're using? I think we're headed in that direction and yeah. for exactly the reasons you said. Are there, you know, I'm trying to think, are there... Have there been landmark studies that are that have shown that? Is that, uh, or is there something ongoing where we're expecting that? I, I, yeah. I'm just trying to remember. There's cardiology. It, <laughs> there's, it's, it's like a fire hose of information. Yeah. Most of it comes from post stent okay. patients. There are five trials now looking at stopping the aspirin instead of the P2Y12 and then continuing the P2Y12. Yep. That's mostly not in patients with AFib, but some of that we we do see in patients with AFib as well. So we understand yeah. how to manage it. Um, but um, E2Y12s, again, give us benefit um, over aspirin in terms of reducing ischemic events. And in general, they're better than aspirin in terms of bleeding as well. So it's a win-win. And I think that's why we're going to see probably also more trials looking at long-term yeah. therapy. Um, because we only really have this out to about 12 months at this point. Yeah. So, and so, as the cost comes down, I guess, eventually with uh, Ticagrelor and, and uh, Clopidogrel is already generic, right? So. right. right. So it's feas more feasible. I think okay. that's right. So it seems to be where we're headed, but um, you know, I think you can confidently say within that first 12 months after an acute coronary syndrome event or a stenting for stable ischemic heart disease, you know, just get, get them right to the P2Y12 at three, six or 12 months uh, yeah. without the aspirin and you're going to be fine. Okay. Yeah. So Good that's, choice. we're going to, we're going to, the next case will go into that a little bit. I wanted to throw one slight other variation to this. So mm -hmm. Coronary artery bypass grafting cabbage, yeah. as we abbreviate it. If if he had an underlying cabbage, not just chronic stable CAD, if he had had prior cabbage, does that change the calculus? Because I, my understanding was with cabbage, it's like lifelong aspirin as well. Is it different yeah. if they're on if they need an OAC? So it doesn't seem to be. So if if um, you're right, if they've had a cabbage, lifelong aspirin has been the recommendation to now mm -hmm. um, and. Personally, this is not guideline and it's, you know, not really well covered by the adaptable trial, let's say, comparing different doses of aspirin. But um, just knowing about saphenous vein grafts, I prefer 325 of aspirin for patients mm. with saphenous vein okay. grafts. If it's not all arterial conduit uh -huh. um, to 81, uh, just because we see what happens as veins degenerate, the flow gets sluggish and those platelets get clumpy. Yeah. So little bit of a buffer there if there's not bleeding risk, 325 is reasonable. But to answer your question, um, you know, I think that um, pretty clear evidence that that the the DOAC is going to cover the um, bypass graft conduits as okay. well, um, as well as the aspirin. Yeah. Uh, and so reasonable to stop the aspirin for those patients okay. as well. Okay. Yeah. So they're not going to be on 325, like a higher dose. Uh, right. Like if, if and, they were... and the, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would not be good. I agree. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did see that. That kind of caught my because it said 100 to 325 of aspirin is like the secondary prevention after uh, coronary bypass, yeah. and I I had not realized that. So that's um, yeah, that's one of those nuances that just you know I just think I thought 81 for of aspirin was what everyone was just getting these days. Yeah. 
Uh, you, you know, um, you know how sausage is made. You know how guidelines are made. They're the same. Yeah. Um, guidelines are sausage making. You, you're dealt the evidence that uh, the trials were designed to give you, right? right? It's not necessarily what you and I would do to yes. design the trial to answer our most important clinical question. It's what industry or history gives us, yeah. right? Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of those earlier trials didn't test 81 milligrams for cabbage because they were pretty early. These are trials back in the 70s and 80s, yeah. right? So they weren't really testing low-dose aspirin at that point. That's why we don't have as much confidence to say it's great to use 81 milligrams. Yeah. It might be just fine, but that's why the recommendation says what it says. And I guess the final variation of this case, which which comes up, so, uh, of course, sometimes too, is if this person, let's say, uh, more than a year ago had had a PCI um, for like an end STEMI as some coronary event, uh, or I don't even know if it matters if it was for if it's if it's at least that far out. If what what why they have the stent, but if they have a stent, you know, and they're on aspirin for that, how does that change your calculus? Uh, um, and they have new AFib now? And they have new AFib, yeah. yeah. So so um, if they have that stent, they're on lifelong antiplatelet therapy, either aspirin or P2Y12. Yeah. Right? Um, now they have this new indication for an antithrombotic, yeah. right? Um, and, and anticoagulant. And so um, uh, again, same thing. I would, I would um, start the oral anticoagulant, make sure that's gonna go well, and then you can stop the antiplatelet okay. therapy. Yeah. And the, Especially and, for those chronic patients. And I gave you that caveat. Yeah, it's a chronic one. So yeah. if it had been like a month ago, they had a stent and now they have new onset AFib, that would be, I feel like that would be a lot of like a, a more of a tricky situation or they'd yeah. be on dual therapy at least for some time. For sure. Yeah. Okay. All right, Paul, any, any questions you want to go on to the we're, next? We're doing great. All right. We, let, I, really, I love, I'm loving the de-escalation talk, by the way. This feels like to have a blessing to start peeling off medications right? at some point feels <laughs> yeah. really nice. Um, yeah. It's good. Well, I, you know, credit to the to the trialists who thought this might work, <clears throat> thought there was equipoise. I agreed that there was equipoise and went and did the did the work and yeah. showed us that this was not only safe but better for the patients. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you, you tease those five trials. So the next case is going to sort of get into the you know where where yeah. those I think came from. We're going to talk about Estelle, who is a 64 year old female. She has type two diabetes, obesity, CKD three A, high blood pressure. Recently admitted with a STEMI. She's seeing us in our primary care office for hospital follow-up. She has been discharged on aspirin and ticagrelor and wants to know how long she needs ticagrelor because of easy bruising and also which is costing her a fortune at this point. Um, not surprisingly, we recall recent trials of short duration dual antiplatelet therapy followed by uh, P2Y12 monotherapy. So what, what can we tell Estelle how we're going to maybe manage things over the next 12 months? Yeah. So again, I, I think uh, important to have a conversation with the person who did her revascularization acutely for that yeah. STEMI that she had just recently. So we understand, you know, the burden of uh, other disease, how difficult was this particular lesion? Um, mm -hmm. You know, do we feel like the stent got well deployed? Just some technical mechanical issues uh, to, to help us understand, you know, just how aggressive we're gonna be with the antiplatelet therapy here. Um, but she's concerned about cost and she's concerned about bruising. Um, so if you think those are rate limiting, um, then reasonable, to stop the aspirin and just continue with the P2Y12 at three months, as early as three months. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd personally try to get her to six months if it's at all possible, because that stent went into a very fresh active lesion. And I want to give that stent time to, to yeah. really get re endothelialized. So three months would be the earliest, six months better, 12 months even better. But, um, uh, you, you know, I think, I think uh, as I say, three months would be the very earliest. Now, as we talked about earlier, um, we could get her switched over to clopidogrel, mm -hmm. um, and that would help at least address some of the cost issues. Yeah. So if she if she's seeing us at uh, three months out, or if it was one month, do you think that would be too early? Like if you know if she. No, I don't think okay. so. You could do it a month. Yeah. yeah. So so maybe that that within that first three months, maybe we maybe we switch over to a lower cost P two I twelve inhibitor. The prasugrel in a in a woman she's sixty four. I was I, I was reading that in patients over seventy five you have to be really careful. Yeah. Is that being used as much? Do we need to? Are we getting too into the weeds thinking about that sort of thing? Um, yeah, I think you will see that we're using much more of the ticagrelor and the clopidogrel uh, than we are using right. prasugrel. Um, th there is benefit in terms of marginal uh, of of prasugrel in comparison with clopidogrel. 
in terms of fewer ischemic events, yeah. but a little bit more bleeding, at least in one of those trials. And so a little bit more careful, I think, with Prasagrel. Okay. Um, and that's probably why you don't see as much of it around. Yeah. And pr Prasagrel, Ticagrelor are both more potent P2I12 inhibitors compared with Clopidogrel. Yeah, more rapid onset, more potent. Yeah. That's correct. All right. What do you, because I, I feel like this comes up, the bruising, I'm glad that you included that in this case. Like, what, what do you do with that information? Like, I feel like it does come up from time to time, but I, I don't know that I often would adjust therapy just sort of based on the patient's report of that. Is there, do you have a specific way that you think about a patient who says, I'm having more bruising with these medications? Um, so, you know, because we're often using these in older patients and we know yeah. Uh, yeah. with thinning of the dermis and, mm -hmm. you know, um, even minor trauma, they're going to bruise anyway. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. sometimes it helps to remind them, well, remember you were bruising before this happened. Right. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I, I think I would, I would hes hesitate to limit good therapy for cosmetic reasons. Um, yeah. But if it's, you know, really causing painful hematomas, if it's limiting function in their arm or, you know, just happening so often that, that you know, it truly is uh, becoming a, a quality of life issue. I think that's reasonable. Um, so I would have a conversation with them about, you know, uh, about potentially stopping this as early as three months, but I would really try to get, get her to three months if at all possible. Gotcha. Yeah. Helpful. Thank you. And, and it sounds like um, if, if cost wasn't an issue and so this, this is a patient we, we gave you, she had a STEMI, so she had a, a major coronary event. She would, she does not have an indication for anticoagulation. So she's just on the dual antiplatelet therapy. And, um, when she gets out to that 12 months from her event, uh, if, if she's okay, clopidogrel may, may be the first choice now, or, but we could also do aspirin. It's sort of either, either, either is an okay answer yep. at this point. Yep. At 12 months, either or yeah. uh, is fine. And, you know, I think if, if cost is not an issue, wouldn't that be nice? Um, yes. But if cost <laughs> were not an issue, um, th there, there is some benefit to ticagrelor compared with clopidogrel right. you know, during those first 12 months. And the number needed to treat is about 50. Uh huh. So we do other things where the number needed to treat is 50, yeah, right? Of so yeah. so um, that is straight up comparison of ticagrelor with cl clopidogrel. Like uh -huh. Treat 50 patients with ticagrelor instead of cl clopidogrel, you will prevent one ischemic event. So, yeah. but cost is an issue. Uh, so, wow. you know, put that maybe in the back of your calculus. And, and then beyond a year, I haven't seen patients on like really long-term uh, ticagrelor, but beyond that one year point, you would, you could just choose whatever P2I12 uh, or, 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 aspirin. or aspirin. Okay. Yeah. So this, so this is becoming more clear now, Paul. I think, I think I'm I hope so. sort of <laughs> clear as mud, right? Yeah. yeah. No, it is. And I, I think we, Paul and I lament about this very often on the show. The fact that, uh, I just want a, a simple yes, no, uh, <laughs> right. no, you know, tell me what to do and maybe just an uh, algorithm with no branch points, maybe, just a series of straight lines all the way down would yeah. be the dream. Yes. Uh, eventually probably AI is going to tell us what to do for all Perfect. these things, but I, I think we're not, we're not there yet. And Paul. then write a beautiful we you know, still discourse have a job. about it. Yeah. Yes. We, we still have a job for now, Paul. So we, 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 we have to learn this stuff. Um, I think that, that kind of squares this case. So we get her out to a year and she's okay. We, we decide we're going to do clopidogrel beyond a year as monotherapy for her. Uh, but let's talk about primary prevention, Paul, because I, I thought I thought this was dead, but maybe not. So let, let's get into a case. No, I love it. So we're going to talk about Regina, who is a 65-year-old uh, woman who does not use tobacco. She has uncontrolled high blood pressure. She has type 2 diabetes that is not well controlled with an A1C of 9.4%. She has pure hypercholesterolemia, um, but reports statin intolerance with myalgias and aches and pains, and so just will not take one. She's seeing you in the office for follow-up of her high blood pressure. Uh, her blood pressure in the clinic consistently is 165 over 92. She is without a whole lot of symptoms to worry. She's not with, she doesn't have chest pain. She doesn't have shortness of breath. She, there's no dyspneal exertion. There's no demon on that stuff. You calculate her 10-year ASCVD risk. It is 25.3%, um, which seems high. <laughs> she has a CAC score that was done three years ago of 114. And we remember that in 2018, we had three large, well-done trials um, that were all negative for aspirin for primary prevention. Um, but still, we don't feel great about Regina because she seems like someone who's just uh, an ischemic event waiting to happen. So how do you think about this patient? Are there exceptions to the, the aspirin verboten for patients um, for primary prevention? Like, where, how are we thinking about these things these days? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, it's a wonderful question. And I think this is right where the, the boundary condition is, uh, is in a patient like Regina. 
So um, remember, you know, why we used to recommend aspirin pretty routinely for primary prevention was those early trials in the 80s, 90s, early mm. aughts, where um, there was a benefit to aspirin compared to placebo uh, for patients who were at risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, and that exceeded the bleeding risk. Yeah. Right. We were preventing more right. heart attacks and strokes than we were causing bleeds. Mm -hmm. And that's why the recommendations routinely in the guidelines for primary prevention were that um, we would recommend low-dose aspirin for primary prevention as long as there was not high bleeding risk and favoring patients at, let's say, a 10% or more 10-year risk for cardiovascular yeah. events. Um, and, you know, I think people were pretty comfortable with that. 2018 completely turned all of that on its head, <laughs> yep. right? So three trials came out really within a month of each other. Um, uh, and just to briefly, if we have time, kind of sure. review those. Yeah. So uh, one trial in um, patients 70 years of age and older, mm -hmm. um, primary prevention, uh, low-dose aspirin versus placebo, stopped early for futility, and a concern that there was actually an increase in all-cause mortality driven by, for the first time ever, never before seen increase in cancer mortality. Yeah, that was, that didn't Which make sense. weird. That really weird. weird. Yeah. No, never be seen before since in all these aspirin trials we've done, nobody's ever reported that. And we were thinking it reduced colon cancer, cancer risk. Cancer, right? Exactly, yeah. right? So. so play of chance, something funky, hard to know. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but certainly a good enough reason to stop that trial, yeah. right? So uh, seven year older, mm, maybe we should be rethinking recommendations about aspirin for primary prevention. Same issue of the journal um, was the study of uh, patients with diabetes 40 years of age and older. Right. Um, and again, lotus aspirin versus placebo uh, stopped early for futility. Again, because the um, sort of absolute risk difference, the benefit for ischemic events was less by 1.1%, but major bleeding increased by 0.9%. So essentially a wash. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think... I think it's fair to put those things on the same playing field. Mm -hmm. Major bleeding is a major event, just as a stroke or a heart attack is a major event. So, yeah. so it was really a wash. And so that made us rethink about recommendations for patients with diabetes. The last one, really maybe the most interesting one was um, a patient, uh, was patients sort of middle-aged and older at elevated risks. So they calculated their risk score, specifically targeted people with 10 to 20% 10 year risk of coronary disease and said, we're gonna put these patients on aspirin mm -hmm. and stopped early for utility. Now there was very little bit of benefit, very little bit of benefit, but the same bleeding risk and they could have gone forever and it really wasn't gonna achieve statistical significance. And what was really fascinating about that was the event rates in that trial were far lower than they thought they were gonna be, probably because 65% on antihypertensive therapy 43% on statin therapy. Yeah. There's really no room for the aspirin now to make a difference, right? Aspirin mm -hmm. is really that safety net medication. If a plaque gets rolling, it's going to prevent the platelets from clumping. Yes. But if we don't let that plaque get rolling in the first place, because we're treating the LDL, we're treating the blood right. pressure, we may not ever get to the point where we need the aspirin. And, right. and so that's the thinking about why the change in the 90s, terrible job treating hypertension. We weren't treating people with statins for primary yeah. prevention. Mm -hmm. Now we are, and aspirin just has less room to make a difference. Yes. We have a lot better blood pressure meds uh, audience. We talk about we talked about this <laughs> on one lot. of our recent shows. We're still like not getting well, we everyone to, to goal. We have a lot of work Especially to do. Especially after the pandemic and all those patients yeah. who got disconnected from their usual right. sources of care. And then the bar has been lowered a little bit, you know, what can, what's considered controlled for, you know, so that's, it's, it's tough. We could talk about 130 over 80 for a long time. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. a fan, but I, I understand it's not not easier. Okay. So you you coined this term maybe uh, primary and a half prevention. Do you, can you talk what you sure. what you mean by that? Yeah, we've used this phrase in my clinic uh, for a long time with uh, my fellows and I. So um, Regina does not have secondary prevention needs. She does not have clinically manifest coronary disease or symptoms therefrom. Uh, she technically requires primary prevention, mm -hmm. therefore, because she's got risk factors but she has the disease. You told me she has a coronary calcium score of 114. Right. Yes. She has the disease. Mm -hmm. So while it's not clinically manifest, I would call her primary and a half prevention. And yeah. I'm gonna be more aggressive with her than I would be with somebody who has a coronary calcium score of zero, mm -hmm. for sure. Right. Um, or you know, if I saw some other manifestation of plaque somewhere else in her body, 
you know, it's primary and a half prevention. And so I'm definitely going to be more aggressive. Now, why do I care about that? Well, getting back to Regina, let me first say, um, I think our job today is to control her acute risk of having an event. The way she's not a smoker, so we don't have to worry about that, but that would be a great thing to get her to stop immediately. But the most important risk factor for her today is her blood pressure, mm -hmm. right? Because if we can control that, she doesn't have a trigger for a stroke. She doesn't have a trigger or not as much of one for an acute coronary syndrome event. Mm -hmm. So I would put all my effort today into getting that blood pressure under control and try to you know, get her back in frequently. Let's spend the next month getting her yeah. under control, period. Then I would start to think about her LDL and whether I want to put her on aspirin. Those are definitely secondary for me. Mm -hmm. like blood pressure, number one by blood far for her. Blood pressure, number one. Yeah. Yeah. In your slides, and I, I don't know if this came from Kanzos, uh, what is it, Kanzos, Acherica, Circulation yeah. 2020, you had these graphs of, based on the CAC score, yeah. uh, CAC score of zero, you know, number needed to treat is very high compared to the number needed to harm. And then yeah. once you get to that CAC score, it looked like greater than 100 for both men and women it, it, yeah. it looks like it starts to make sense. So again, you know, kind of thinking about this net benefit on mm -hmm. the absolute risk scales, you know, are we more likely to prevent an event than to cause bleeding? Right. So does Regina need aspirin? So um, all comers, she has diabetes. She's in the range where we said futility. All comers, no. Default would be, mm -hmm. would be to say no. But we know a little bit more about Regina. She has this coronary calcium score of 114, putting her in my primary and a half bin. Um, and what you said is right. So um, Miguel Kanzos Asherika, beautiful paper using the MESA study where we went back and looked and said, okay, is there a threshold of coronary calcium where the net benefit appears for aspirin compared to the bleeding risk? So mm -hmm. number needed to treat is better than number needed to harm. Yeah. And the breakpoint was at 100 for the coronary mm -hmm. calcium score. So that patient has enough burden of disease where you are more likely to prevent an event with aspirin than you are to cause a major bleed. Yeah. So for me, that's pretty meaningful because again, it's the disease. It's not just mm -hmm. risk. She has the disease. And I think that's the, the yeah. real differentiator. Yeah. And this was over a five-year period that you were looking at the number needed to treat, number needed to harm in this one? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Well, so what we're really doing is we're applying the you know projected benefit of aspirin mm -hmm. and the projected bleed risk on these, on these participants in MESA yes. to say, where's okay. the break-even point? or the coronary calcium score. Yeah, I have to think we're not gonna be so absolute about this at some point in the future. Uh, and because I feel like the primary prevention is so nebulous in circumstances like this. Like for instance, if you add tobacco use to this patient, like they probably have, I don't know if this is a term, like subclinical CAD, like it's, it's yeah. it has to be there. So I feel like there's gonna be some ways where you're gonna be a little bit more sophisticated about teasing out who may benefit, even if they haven't had an ischemic event that declares itself yet. But I just, I think it sounds like right. we're not quite there yet other than, than CAC scoring, it sounds like. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, mm -hmm. we, we hopefully will get there, but I, you, you bring up important, like, a patient who's a heavy smoker, mm -hmm. you know, if their 10 year risk is 10% and they're a heavy smoker, well, I'm thinking hard about aspirin in that patient, you know, yeah. as long as they're not like, got it, as long as they don't have a huge bleed risk, I'm thinking pretty hard about it because, you know, um, th that's the patient, as you said, probably got disease. I could go look. Um, but, you know, that heavy smoking, all those risk factors that she has, she's going to have the disease and yeah. she's, you know, she's the person. Not everybody will benefit. That's why the default answer is don't do it. But there are people within that who will benefit. And mm -hmm. she's much more likely to be one of those people. Right. And this would be in the, uh, assuming we're good primary care doctors, we have America's primary care doctor here. <laughs> sure. He would be trying to get her it's to- you. Her, her to <laughs> stop smoking. Who knew? Her, her to get her to stop smoking, control the blood pressure. Just firing off the azetamide, just probably, really making a Probably already on yeah. a cholesterol lowering medication. Well, but she was statin, statin intolerant. I mean, we can yeah, talk about that too. But intolerant, yeah. 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 So we, 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 made it, we made it hard there. But uh, the aspirin would be, if you had to choose between statin and aspirin for patients for primary prevention, is, is statin still your, you know, the tool of choice, like for most patients? For the intermediate to long-term, yes. Yeah. Because yeah. okay. again, that's going to um, delipidate the plaque. It's going to passivate the right. plaque, going to make it much more stable so that we're much less likely to even need the okay. aspirin, right? All right. Well, so short-term aspirin, long-term, get that LDL as low as possible. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm sure we could iterate on this all day, but I know you've had a long day uh, and we, we got to so sort much. Sort of devolving really, patient consults at this point. Yeah, yeah. This, was, this was really helpful. Um, definitely learned a lot. I wanted to give, uh, I want to get some take-home points. Then I want to ask you about this number eight on your coat there. Okay. Uh, so first, 
if there's any major, like one or two take home points that you really want our primary care listeners to remember from what we talked yeah. about today, or I guess our hospitalists too, because they're going to be discharging people, people yep. they yeah. need to know. So I, you know, I guess I would say, think about the patient. Are they secondary prevention or primary prevention? Secondary prevention, they need the therapy, mm-hmm. right? That it is indicated. And so we're really making decisions about um, the, the amount of therapy and the duration of that therapy. And, yeah. and again, you said this well, I think the fact that we can now deescalate, you know, deprescribe um, at relatively predictable intervals and know that it's safe to do that, I think that's hugely liberating. And, and again, I would encourage primary care docs to talk to the operator who put that stent in or, you know, talk to the stroke neurologist to make sure we're doing the right thing you yeah. know, based on what they see the, the clinical risk being. Um, so, so I think that that's really actually quite powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, in primary prevention, you know, the margin of decision making is a little bit tighter, right? The benefit to risk is, is closer. Um, and so I think, you know, use the tools of these, of these risk scores so that you can really line up the decision making on the right axis and say, yeah. I really am more likely to prevent an event here than to cause a bleed. It's not going to be perfect, right? Mm-hmm. These are probabilities. We will have patients who will bleed. Doesn't mean you, mean you made the wrong decision. Like, try to do your best. Use the math to help you. And yeah. that's what those risk scores can do. All right. So now for plugs, uh, tell us about this number eight. You you told us like briefly about it, but uh, I, I want to hear more about this. So I had the privilege of uh, working closely with the American Heart Association um, and and was actually the, the Heart Association president uh, last year. Um, and one of the things that we've really been pushing over the last decade is uh, the construct of cardiovascular health. So we've all been working hard to reduce cardiovascular disease deaths, and we've seen dramatic improvements since the 1970s, mm-hmm. 70% reductions in cardiovascular disease death rates. Yeah. Like we don't celebrate that enough. That's pretty striking. That is, That's impressive. I did not know that number. That is impressive. Yeah. And as we've been talking about today, we've been getter, been getting better at treating risk factors. Mm-hmm. Not good enough, but better. Um, in 2010, the, the Heart Association said, let's actually start to think about promoting cardiovascular health, not just preventing disease and mm-hmm. death. And so they added this sort of new layer. They asked a group of us to define cardiovascular health. Like easy to say, what is health? Uh-huh. Health is more than just the absence of disease. And so we created a quantifiable metric of cardiovascular health, which at the time was called Life Simple 7 and included healthy diet, physical activity, not smoking, healthy weight, um, healthy blood pressure, healthy blood glucose, healthy blood cholesterol. And we kind of gave thresholds for what was optimal and then what was less optimal. And you could create a cardiovascular health score, if you will. Oh, yeah. Okay. And it allowed people to focus on what can I change today to improve my health? Uh Um, and not just think about preventing something that's going to happen 30 years from now. I'm impressed you rattled off that list. Uh, I was like... (laughs) (laughs) Well, I've lived with it for 13 years. Yeah, I'm impressed. So so anyway, um, uh, scientists did what they do. They dug in on it. They showed us that the cardiovascular health score is really tied to many, many favorable health outcomes Mm -hmm. over your lifespan. Less cancer. Of course, less cardiovascular disease, yes, but less cancer, less chronic kidney disease, less atrial fibrillation, um longer lifespan, longer health span. So you avoid comorbidities as you age just by having a higher cardiovascular health score at mm-hmm. longer ages. So we updated the construct a year ago. It's now, instead of Life Simple 7, it's Life's Essential 8. We kind of revamped the scoring, but we added a new metric, which is sleep duration, because we now have mm-hmm. a lot of good evidence mm-hmm. about the importance of sleep for heart health, yeah. right? It, it affects all those other things that I mentioned, Maybe not cholesterol, but for sure, your weight, your your dietary choices, your ability to do physical activity affects your blood pressure, affects your blood sugar, all those other things. And it independently actually can predict cardiovascular risk. So so sleep duration, optimal seven to nine hours per night. Um, and that gives you life's essential eight. And it, it I think it's a great way for clinicians to help patients focus on, let's pick that one thing you want to work on and we know we'll be improving your health and we can actually... You go on the website, Life's Essential yeah, I was 8. Gonna, yeah, yeah um, w- you can actually calculate your, your Life Essential 8 score, 0 to 100. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you improve and change, your cardiovascular health score will improve and change with you. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I, th- I think I feel like this is a great thing for uh, primary care too because this is sure. basically what we, we talk to patients about and it's, it's nice to have like a website to point them to like, here's the stuff you want to focus on because yeah. I... And, and it might seem overwhelming, right? Yeah. Here are eight things. No, 
pick one, work on that, make it better. Yeah. As after you sort of do your score, you can get sort of red light, yellow light, green light for the different metrics, you know, how you're mm -hmm. doing and click through on anything you want to work on. And you get the great American Heart Association content on how to make this better. And I think it can be a really useful tool for patients. If there's a score, it's gamified a little bit. It's, I feel like right. it's more, you're more invested rather than you should just do better, which is not a helpful thing to be telling patients, but to have numbers that you can actually sort of improve on your own by, by making changes. Yeah. It seems like it's a little bit more meaningful. And, and, and I think that's right. And I, I think that, um, you know, the goal here is not to get everybody to hundred. That's not realistic, but better is better. Right. And, uh, and they can actually see their numbers change as they improve things. And audience, we'll be calculating Paul's score, posting it on Twitter. Let's not do that. <laughs> if, the, if the sleep part matters, I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. One of these days will be more definitive. It'll be a, a yummy. It'll feel <laughs> still gross. <laughs> um, still hungry for more? Join our Patreon and get all of our episodes ad-free, plus twice monthly bonus episodes at patreon.com slash curbsiders. You can find our show notes at thecurbsiders.com, and you can sign up for our mailing list while you're there to get our weekly show notes in your inbox, which includes our Curbsiders Digest that recaps the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. You can also email us at askcurbsiders at gmail.com. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. Wanted to give a special thanks to our whole Curbsiders team who makes it happen behind the scenes. Our technical production is done by the team at Podpace. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media. Chris the Chew Man Chew runs our Discord. And Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. With all that, Paul, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And that would be the Matthew Frank Watto, who was also the writer and producer for this episode, but he's too modest to name that himself <laughs> while reading those things. And as always, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Thank you and goodbye.